And we are back on the Zero Hour. With us is Richard Rothstein, who is a research associate with the Economic Policy Institute. And, and uh, Richard has written a very important paper on Brown versus the Board of Education 60 years later. That, of course, being the landmark Supreme Court ruling requiring uh, the integration of schools and striking down the concept of separate but equal in education, and, and Richard has, has written a provocative piece about that, suggesting that it succeeded in ways that may not have been expected and failed in ways that may have been expected. Uh, Richard Rothstein, thanks so much for being with us. Good morning. Now, my one-sentence summary of your piece, I don't know if it did it justice or not, but let me know. Did it? Well, it was close. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that uh, it was expected that Brown would fail to integrate schools, but in fact, the day after the Brown decision was issued, uh, Thurgood Marshall, who was then the lead attorney for the plaintiffs, uh, expect, said he expected that uh, within five years, schools across the country would be desegregated. Well, I'm going to plead for for uh, an upgrade in my and the grade you just gave me because what I actually said was that it it failed in ways that might have been expected to succeed and succeeded in ways that weren't expected. Oh, okay. um, and I, th- which sounds about right, I guess, yeah. as as you say that. Um, yes, I said so, what I said in in the piece is that it stimulated a whole civil rights movement that succeeded in other areas, uh, public accommodations, sit-ins took place, freedom rides. Uh, a number of civil rights bills were passed. The area where it succeeded the least was in desegregating schools, which are today nationwide uh, as segregated as they've ever been. Well, and in fact, I believe you said at one point that things were getting worse. Well, they are getting worse since 1980. There was the courts enforced desegregation up until about 1980, at which point the com- composition of the courts changed, uh, the Supreme Court in particular. And school districts began to be released from desegregation orders. And since then, segregation nationwide has increased. And it's increased because our residential segregation has uh, increased. Black students are now more isolated from white students than they have been any time in the last 35 years. So we had a decision that had the very laudable effect of bringing the issue of segregation to the public consciousness and and um, changing public attitudes and, and perhaps contributing substantially to the rise of the civil rights movement and many of the changes that arose out of that. We had some improvements, but they reversed in, in 1980. Things, if anything, are getting worse because of uh, uh, residential patterns and so on. What about, what about 1980, do you think, caused a shift in the trend? Well, the main reason, as I said, is the courts uh, began to back off requiring school districts to desegregate. But as you just mentioned, the real issue is that schools are segregated today because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. And we have done very little to adopt the kinds of housing policies that would be necessary to desegregate our neighborhoods. So African Americans in most urban areas, metropolitan areas in this country, are living in in neighborhoods that are concentrated, uh, largely poor in many cases. And this is all a legacy of of 20th century federal, state, and local policy that purposely segregated these neighborhoods. And because they were segregated by public policy, we're unlikely to desegregate them without public policies that undo the effects of the of the last century. We're talking with Richard uh, Rothstein of the Economic uh, Policy Institute. Well, tell us about that government policy that led to well, that segregation. For example, I, th- I think, I think most people of need your to know that. You've probably heard of uh, uh, large suburban developments like Levittown or in California, Daly City or Lakewood, south of Los Angeles, all over the country. These large suburban developments were funded, financed, uh, with guarantees from the federal government on condition that the federal government set that no homes be sold to African Americans. So the whole suburbanization that took place in the mid-20th century was segregated by federal requirement and subsidized uh, by the federal government. Uh, We have not undone those policies. Uh, The suburbs that were created in that time have now appreciated in value uh, at the time, in the mid-20th century, uh, African Americans, along with whites, uh, could have afforded to move to those suburbs. 
they've now appreciated working class people, middle class people can frequently no longer afford to move to those suburbs. And so the patterns that were sent by public policy, set by public policy in the mid-20th century um, have endured. And as a result, we have segregated neighborhoods that persist in this country despite the nominal uh, prohibition of discrimination in housing. And so what you have also is a vicious circle where even though we have allegedly, a, well, an, as you say, a nominal prohibition in housing discrimination, uh, it's very hard for people to afford them without jobs, good jobs, and the jobs tend to be where these houses are, making it even harder um, for people to break in. So you have this ongoing segregation that's a historical legacy of government policy. Well, tell us briefly then, what kind of policy do you think might uh, serve to undo this damage that was done in the past? Well, there are a number of policies we could pursue, and they, they won't solve the problem entirely, but there are some small steps we can take. Many suburbs have ordinances, zoning ordinances, that prohibit the construction of low- and moderate-income housing. They're called exclusionary zoning ordinances. Those could be prohibited to enable uh, developers to construct low- and moderate-income housing in, in uh, white suburbs, predominantly white suburbs. We have a program which subsidizes the rents of uh, low-income families so that they can afford to uh, rent apartments uh, uh, at market rents, but we don't have a, a requirement that landlords have to accept those subsidies, those vouchers that these families have. We could require landlords to uh, not discriminate uh, against the housing choice voucher holders, and that would permit uh, more uh, African Americans to move to uh, more middle class neighborhoods. Uh, and there was also a time in history when it was not unthinkable to discuss building subsidized housing in uh, relatively well-to-do neighborhoods so that these uh, living patterns of separation and segregation could be broken down. It seems like that's left the national conversation altogether. Well, you're absolutely right. That was the next thing I was going to mention. That has to be combined with the repeal of these exclusionary zoning ordinances, but as you just noted, simply repealing an ordinance that prohibits the, the construction of that kind of housing won't uh, do any good unless we subsidize the construction of that kind of housing. So both policies are necessary. Well, in about the minute, uh, in about the minute we have left, Richard Rothstein of the Economic Policy Institute, what can people do with this information? They can obviously go to epi.org and, and read your fine work on this, but uh, are there organizations you're aware of, ways people can maybe uh, get their voice heard on this subject? Well, there are many organizations throughout the country. I can't name them in different cities for you. It was, there wouldn't be time, but there are many organizations that promote uh, low- and moderate-income housing in suburban neighborhoods, and people can Google them with those in their communities and find them to help support them. I think this is such an important contribution to the conversation, so I thank you for writing this piece, and I, you know, I think that people, too much of our public policies nowadays is around this issue is driven by despair or fear or uncertainty, and I think you've done a lot to dispel those kinds of dark clouds over this topic. So Richard Rothstein of the Economic Policy Institute, thanks for uh, joining us and talking about this subject with us. Thank you very much. Now, we will be back in the next hour talking about the problems of prediction with futurist Jamey Cassio. Um, you know, I was called a futurist in a book by a rough guy, but I don't know. I we'll talk about what that word even means. I'm not even sure. We'll be talking about the student activism that's taking place against Peabody Energy with a student activist. We'll be talking with Bianca Alexander about fair and sustainable fashion and a fashion revolution day uh, in this, the one-year anniversary of the tragedy in Bangladesh. So please stick with us. I'm R.J. Eskow, and this is The Zero Hour.